Coach, um, how um, uh, you all got a chance to look at Drake? Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how, how did he look? And then just what's the balance like of, uh, you know, getting the rookies ready to play, uh, the production, and, uh, you know, the decision of how much to put on their plate as, as rookies? Yeah, it, it's a very good question because it's, it's important. You know, you're getting ready to go. Obviously, week one matters right to us in the short term, but the way the season plays out, it's such a long season, especially for the rookies. And at the end of the day, you can only dress 48. And sometimes you got to make decisions based on, hey, here's what the game plan is, or here's what we're going to lean on the game plan. Do we, do we put this player up because if somebody gets injured on the first play, are we going to be out of it? So there's a lot of strategy here, and you try to get that in perspective. Um, certainly when you're dealing with rookies, um, you know, it's – they're gonna. Everything's gonna be new for them. They played in the preseason, but we'll have to see who, you know who can handle what. And we have to understand there's a long-term vision at play as well. They may not have a lot of productivity in week one. Doesn't mean by week five they may be up and really helping us. Drew Dahlman named the starter. What mm -hmm. did you see from him in the last weeks of the preseason to really separate himself? Well, it was a tough competition, and I've said it many times. You've got to be objective and you try to be as fair as you can be. Um, so you go back over, over the weekend and you look at the whole, whole training camp, whole training camp and preseason, and, and it was tough. And that's because you got two really good young players. It's not an easy decision, but ultimately you get paid to make decisions. And, and so that's a decision that, you know, I had to make. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're appointing them, uh, you know, to a lifetime job there, but um, they had a good competition and just felt where we're at right now that uh, we'll go with Drew. When it comes to facing this de the Saints defense on Sunday, I believe they were ranked first in opponent touchdown percentage in the red zone last year. What made them so so good at that point in the field when you faced them? Yeah, I think they do a really good job of, um, you know, they got some really good veteran players that they they know when to turn it on in critical situations, and I think that's uh, they've got a clear identity. You know, Dennis obviously being the head coach, he's still the play caller, and, and they've established a really good culture down there. They play aggressive. They roll guys up front. But they got the veterans, and I think when they get down there and the, and the field tightens like that, they know exactly who they are. They've played together a long time, and, and usually in those critical situations, that's why some of those guys get paid the way they do. Uh, they, they've stepped up. Arthur, you guys are practicing in the stadium today. Mm -hmm. Why did you make that decision? To Just to that? make your commute easier. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but in all seriousness, just – and this is a blessing when you get to work to a place like the Atlanta Falcons and for Arthur Blank and Rich McKay, it allows you to come down here. And a big thing for me is being part of this city and ultimately just from a practical sense is we get to train in the environment we're going to play in on Sunday. And that's important to us is to be really good at home. In my bias opinion, we've got the best stadium in all of, all of sports and we need to make this our home. We need to, to win at home. Um, there's always ways you go back and look at it, you know, make an argument for or against. But if we could have found a way to win two more home games, there's a great chance we would have kept playing. But we didn't. And that's the reality. And we got to be better at home. Was some of it, too, that you didn't have the two preseason games at home, so this is an extra – an added – No, that's not really what my thought was. I mean, it's another way to look at it. Um, but you just want to get familiar with the building. And it's a – like I said, there's nothing like opening day in the NFL. And we got an opportunity to come down here and practice – like I said, they're lucky because a lot of organizations, they don't allow you to do things like that or, uh, you know, cut costs. But we're able to, to put the team, get on buses, come down here and, and train in the place we'll play on Sunday. And kind of following a little bit on what Tori asked, like Dennis Allen in his first time being a head coach. Well, do you, he was a head coach before. Well, first time in New Orleans. New Orleans. It's yeah. been a while since he was in Oakland. But it's a good recovery. You, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> do you – do you see any – do you anticipate any change because he had been there for so long and because Pete had been there for so long also? Well, Dennis is his own guy. So, obviously, Sean Payton is, is a big presence and great football coach. And, I, you know, they've established something really good. But a lot of times you're transitioning. Dennis is his own guy. He's a hell of a football coach. Um, they've certainly established identity on defense. But I'm, I'm sure – and I don't want to speak for him, but he'll end up doing things his own way. And Pete Carmichael is a – really bright football coach, and he'll have his own stamp on it the way he calls it. Um, it happens all the time when you're in transitions. And, and we know we got a ton of respect for this staff, 
what they're about. And we expect an intense, this rivalry in this next chapter to be just as intense or if not more. And that's, and that's a mutual respect. What's the expectation for Drake on Sunday? Is he like he a full go right now in practice or? We're just going to have to keep seeing. And, you know, he practiced Monday. We'll see what it looks like the rest of the week. And then we got to make a decision on Saturday. Um, if he's playing, if he's not, you know, how much you want to put on his plate. So th th it, we won't know till the end of the week. And um, also, like, how do you educate the rookies on kind of what to expect in this first, you know, game just to kind of prepare them mentally, especially when you're going up against right. the Saints? Yeah, you try to use different, you know, ways to, to get the point across. Um, you go back and, you know, history of week one, and, and we talked about it last year, and you see it happen all over the league. It's a lot of times week one, there's, it's kind of messy out football right there. We'd like to be the point where we don't have the self-inflicted wounds. You know, guys are going to be nervous whether they played in the preseason or not. Uh, the adrenaline will be flowing, and uh, a lot of times you can tell them, they can talk to the veterans, but at the end of the day, they got to experience it for themselves. You've been very deliberate with CP's preparation plan. Right. Is, is he where you had hoped he would be right now, and will you continue to manage him as carefully throughout regular season, or do you just have to see how it goes? No. Uh, Another good question. Yeah, we're very happy where he's at. Obviously, you got to be willing to adapt, uh, feel good about the plan, but we'll always be flexible and just see how it goes. Um, certainly, he's an important part of this team and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Same offense, Arthur. You didn't see Jameis last year. How much does Jameis change the dynamic of what you're going to see from the Saints? Yeah, I mean, different quarterbacks, right? They played a lot of, had to play a lot of different guys. We saw Trevor and, and Taysom. Um, with Jameis, you know, going against him when he's in Tampa, he's got a live arm, um, and I got a lot of respect for him. I mean, he's going to keep swinging um, how it goes, and, and they got they got good talent around him. So he, he's got a heck of a heck of an arm. He's got good experience in this league, and and if we can't affect him early, he can make it hell for us. What can you do now in practice to kind of prevent a slow start with week one, with, especially with guys like CP who haven't played yet in the preseason? He did play in the preseason. Well, not a lot. Yeah, I'll just make sure we got that out there. <laughs> um, no, we feel good about him. You know, that's stuff we monitor in those practices. He did play a little bit. I understand what you're, what you're saying in all seriousness. Um, no different than Grady. You know, we, Grady got a handful of snaps. We assessed where he's at. Felt like he was ready to go. Same thing with CP. So he, this isn't his first rodeo. We feel like he's in good shape. Uh, love the way he's been practicing and been working. One more, if mm -hmm. I could. Um, you talked about the Saints knowing who they are. Where do you guys feel like you guys are in your journey of figuring out who the Falcons are this season? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, like I said the other day, it's a completely different team we're taking in, and it, it happens a lot. Uh, just the way the league's set up, and it's so much more transactional now than it was in the 80s pre-free agency and, and some of the different uh, you know, salary cap restrictions or I think today in society people are way more transactional than they used to be. So you're, you're always going to have a little bit different of a team. They've got some veterans that have been there. They've added some other veterans. Uh, you know, Jarvis Landry, Tyron Matthew, guys that I have a ton of respect for that will add something to their team as well. So with us, we feel pretty good at this point. We feel like we're ready to go. It's certainly not going to ask guys to do something we haven't trained for already. So. Uh, like, we're excited as hell that we get to open up here with the Saints. Uh, yeah, Coach, just a, a couple here. Um, how do the new weapons fit in, you know, London, Edwards, and uh, Damian Williams and the great spirit of things offensively? Uh, you know, we got a lot of different weapons. So that's our job. New, is new, new. New? Yeah. New. Uh, sometimes I look at guys, too, that take a jump, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit improved. So mm -hmm. you hopefully you get a better version of Kyle, uh, CP, Alamade Zacchaeus. Um, so feel good about where they're at. I'm not going to get into the schemes here. We'll let Dennis and those guys try to figure it out on Sunday. And uh, um, do you have any theories on why we're seeing quarterbacks get second chances, not just here, uh, a lot of lot around the league here uh, this season? Uh, I don't know if there are people who are washing them out, but a lot of guys are getting a second op around the league this year. I just think it's the way the league is. I mean, I think that's why those guys get paid the amount of money they do. It's so hard to find guys that can play quarterback in the NFL. And guys, different reasons sometimes to change the scenery. Guys learn. We've seen that over and over, and that's nothing new. Guys that have gone different places, even 
back in the day and gone to a new environment and, and taken off. Um, I think now what you're seeing, again, it's, it's a hard position to play. It's so different than even what they're asked to do in college. And sometimes if they're not in the right environment, climate, uh, guys can have some early failure, but they're still good players. And, you know, you want to give them another opportunity. And, and at the end of the day, kind of what I said at the beginning, it's amazing in this country, right, and over 300 million plus people, 32 quarterbacks in the NFL, it's hard to find. So that's probably why the, the market dictates what some of those top guys get paid. And uh, just uh, I had an extra one coming to my mind. Kamara had the big game last time. Uh, how big of a you know issue is he? And then yeah. Cam Jordan's had big games throughout uh, in this yeah, series. Both of them, uh, uh, really good football players. Uh, Kamara, you know, he can make you pay if you get a, if he gets going, and he's a problem. Uh, not only running, but you know, use him in the passing game, and uh, he can make them make them go. And then Cam Jordan, I was kind of hoping he was going to go ahead and join you guys in the media. Um, maybe he needs to get a new talent agent. I probably could have helped him get more money where he doesn't have to, you know, because I, I, honestly, in all seriousness, I see a guy, he predict he'll be on the network shows one of these days. And maybe, Cam, if you're listening, I could have gotten you more money and you wouldn't had to take on double teams and cuts and chips that may be thrown at you on Sunday. So, but I'm, I'm ready for him to start to join you guys. <laughs> Arthur, going back to kind of the preseason, when you look back at it now, how did you balance making sure Marcus got enough reps so he would be ready now versus yeah. getting Desmond enough reps so that way you had at least a sign of what Yeah, he, he might needed be. to play. Um, so, you know, it, who you wanted him out there with, seeing what it looked like. Um, felt he had a good preseason, but the same thing until he got out there and play. Um, and then the same where he's at, what he needed to prove – and assess where he's ready, and then developing the, the young guys. I think that's the hardest thing to do right now is develop uh, young offensive linemen and quarterbacks. From an offense standpoint, the only the best training is to play in the preseason. So you're trying to balance him getting ready, making sure that he's can do the job and he's up to par there, and then the same time trying to develop some young guys. So it's a fine balance. How, how much was he part of that conversation? And, and well, how certainly much talked to him about it. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't run a dictatorship. We have our thoughts as a staff and we go to the players and I listen and we got to assess and make the best decision for this team. But I certainly, I'll talk to all our players. I, I never have a problem. Maybe it's my Jesuit education and asking why. It doesn't ever bother me when guys ask me why we're doing something. Coach, you were talking about Jameis earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. For you guys, since you have a new quarterback week one, obviously one that is very different than this team has had for a long time. What kind of an advantage will that give you against the Saints? Uh, I don't know much of an advantage. I mean, we got to, at the end of the day, it's still going to be about can we, on offense, I mean, can we block, move the ball, um, you know, fundamentally get open and score in the red zone and, and, vi and vice versa on defense. Can we cover, can we tackle, uh, and the same in the kicking game. So that's what it'll really come down to. Uh, they got good players. It's opening day. Um, like I said, we're excited. We feel good about where they're at. I'm sure they feel great about where they're at too. So it, it, hopefully it's a big time environment and here on Sunday at 1 o'clock. You mentioned quarterbacks dealing with maybe early failure in their career, but how much do you talk to your guys about dealing with failure on a micro level, just in terms why? of put why? Why is, why is that such a because big Because I think that's the only way you really truly improve. If you step in this and you're afraid to fail as a coach, you're just trying to survive, and you'll be a dime a dozen. You may make some good money. You may get you know change logos five or six times. Great, but the great, my best learning experience has been failure, and you're going to put yourself out here um, as a player and as a coach, and sometimes it is painful, but you know what you signed up for. And I've learned more lessons from failure. And you know, hist historically, you know, go look at. Uh, I thought it was pretty good that Derek Jeter documentary talks about him early in his career. And you talk about pressure, got being an early pick, playing in that in that market, in that organization. And uh, I think it's good for all of us if you if you have the right mindset to know understand how to handle failure. Is that a difficult or challenging message for you to get across no. to players who are sort of at an elite level in their sport? No, who may it's not at all. Because any great one, I know there's a lot of famous quotes and things like that. But you go, whether you're talking about Michael Jordan, all the all the great players in a lot of a lot of sports, usually they've had to overcome some kind of obstacle or failure. It probably helped them drive and understand and improve. I mean, the worst kind of guys are the ones that are afraid. 
uh, to, you know, to make a mistake and they're worried about so hard about criticism or what somebody's saying about them online, um, you're basically done if that's your mindset. And left turn, complete left turn. Sure. The change in the preseason, the, it feels like you played guys more, you're coming we down did. here this week, is how much of that, if any, is a reflection of the way of week one last year against the Eagles? It's not just week one. I think you go back and assess the whole thing, right? So, and this is a different team, and you've got you to gotta make decisions that you think is best for your team to get them ready to play not only week one, but, but 17, hopefully uh, more than that, games. Uh, I do, you know, I'm a hypocrite if I don't look at myself first and say, hey, what can we do better? And there's got to be a sound reason why, because you can make a great argument for or against really any decision you make. So you go back and you take the offseason, and that's what they pay me to do. i got to make decisions what I th- think. And we use the whole staff and people are involved. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I've got to make the decision. So you go back and you look at it. We felt with this team, where we're at, youth, lessons learned from last year, it's about learning from certain failures. Okay, what can we do better? Go back and look at other, the way other people have done it historically and where we're at, and that may change next year. But we felt this was the best for, our, for us, and we'll see where it goes. I want to go back to something you were talking about with seeing um, growth in Kyle Pitts, and I know it's something you've talked about in terms of seeing growth in his blocking, and I know everybody's going to want to talk about how many catches he's going to have, but how did you see him take ownership of that part of his game this offseason? Well, he's got the right mindset. I have to, I've said it before. Uh, you know, you forget he's only 21. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of times the guys that come in the league with that amount of hype and, and potential, um, it can be overwhelming for him. But he's continued to get better. He's got the right mindset. At the end of the day, with all these guys, there's, there's really two ways, right? There's people that care about stats, and you can make a subjective argument in a 32 team league. What matters, what really matters is winning. And I think at the end of the day, it's the hardest urge to fight is to not be selfish as a coach and player. Stats, money, because in the, the day, if you win as a team, usually people get rewarded. So, yeah, coach guys, that you had a poor year, and they caught 95 footballs. Great. You won three games. Congratulations. Maybe it makes you money. You come back the next year, and you're able to, to change it to a winning culture, and you win more. Maybe your production goes down, but you affected winning more, and you played in more games. And then when you're playing in games that are matter – in late December and January, it usually works out really well for coaches and players. And so that's what we try to focus on. It's the same human urge you have all the time is to not be selfish, and we all fight that. But when you're trying to a team, you don't care about stats. You're trying to find ways to win, and ultimately, if everybody can buy in, you'll have a lot of success in the long run. This might be like a very philosophical question. Sure, I'm but... on a philosophical <laughs> rant. Let's go. <laughs> I feel like it. So you talked about failure. So when's a very notable time? in your life that you failed, and what did you learn from it? I mean, a lot. Uh, I mean, even in my coaching career. Things that maybe I thought I was a quality control, that I had an arrogant belief that, oh, if I get my chance, I'll do it this way. And you get your chance, and you tried something, and you say, oh, I see what some of these old coaches were telling me. Um, whether, you know, you have a game where you score 40-plus points or <laughs> you score zero, uh, don't buy. Don't buy the lie either way. Because it's to me, if you can go back and assess how can I improve, how I can get better, that's how you'll win in the long run. So that's kind of how I've looked at it. And I was just curious real quick, do you ever plan maybe this during the season to, like, come and have a practice here? Or is it just first game of the season, like, going to do it? So how it goes. I mean, we ha- don't have it on the calendar right now. The opportunity came about. Played two games in here this weekend. Um, I told Grady and AJ they were better honorary captains than Marcus was. But... <laughs> There's two games played in there. United's got a game on Saturday, so the opportunity came up. And, you, you know, that's the thing. You've got essentially two weeks to get ready for week one. The opportunity came up and talked to Rich about it, and we were able to pull it off, thanks to a lot of people at the stadium and up at Flowery. Not to harp on the whole failure conversation, but I'm just curious if you've seen guys take those kinds of lessons from last year, maybe some tough situations that they've sure. internalized and kind of propel them forward into this year, this week one. Yeah, I would, uh, I would hope that they did, we'll find out this Sunday at 1. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it in practice, and you've seen it day after day, and that's the challenge, you know, not just the first day of camp or, you know, it's the third week or coming out. So you're very hopeful based on what you've seen. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.